sorrow, suffering and pain. The government and big companies are the ones to blame. I'm a whore, yeah, I'm a heartless before. So control your life, get the money supply. The country is a whole nation Increasing the interest, decrease the dollar by inflation We are slaves to the banks, that's the bottom line They take a person and turn them into a dollar sign Near the end of 2012, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation announced that Canada's national debt hit $600 billion An all-time high and record in all of Canada's financial history Actually, in mathematical factuality, our debt will continually increase and will never decrease because that's the way usury monetary mechanics works. At the current rate, Canada's national debt is rising by $74.6 million a day or $863 every second. That means you and nearly every other Canadian taxpayer owes $17,200 to private banks because they are the ones that created Canada's currency out of thin air and lent it to us at compounded interest attached. From 1938 until 1974, the national debt never rose above $18 billion a year, which was manageable. The Bank of Canada issued a large portion of these loans with little to no interest added meaning money was made out of thin air for the public to use for free for the use of commerce, build infrastructure, and put towards social programs. This, was this made it possible for low taxation, people got more money for their labor, and lived real debt-free lives. Today is the exact opposite. As you can probably see, I'm a child of the Depression, and I saw poverty in its rawest form. And... Um, something about the present situation that reminds me of the Great Depression. With a million more or more young people out of jobs between the ages of 15 and 25. This is a national tragedy. The only difference today, I think, between now and then is that um, we have a social security system which was uh, born from the people who survived the Great Depression and who were, at that time, determined that it would never happen again. In 1938, early 39, there were no jobs in Canada, none. And started creating very, very large sums of basically zero-cost money for the government of Canada. And the government of Canada spent this money into circulation, and pretty soon everyone was working or in the armed forces. Unemployment came down to an historic low of 1%. And the Bank of Canada used that system to get us out of the Depression, to finance World War II, and then after that, as has already been said, to help finance some of our great post-war infrastructure, like the St. Lawrence Seaway and the Trans Canada Highway and the great new airport terminals, and indirectly, because there was enough money around to pass to the provinces, the things like uh, the Gardner Expressway and the Toronto Subway, the first one, and so on, and there was money to do these things. There was money to pay for the infrastructure. And there was money for people to get ahead and to grow their businesses. And everything was working smoothly until 1974. In that 36-year period, our debt only rose to $18 billion at the end of 1974. The Bank of Canada funded Canada through the Second World War, even funded major infrastructure programs like St. Lawrence Seaway and the Trans-Canada Highway. Can you name one infrastructure program of that scale in our nation since 1974? Have we had to get through any major wars lately? No. So how come our national debt is 33.3 times higher than it was in 1974? Well, to answer that, we have to take a look at who was in power in those days. In 1974, we got Pierre Trudeau as Prime Minister and Gerald Bowie as the Governor of the Bank of Canada. Pierre Trudeau, like many other Canadian Prime Ministers, attended the Bilderberg Group meetings before being elected. Trudeau also served in the mid-1990s on the Power Corp's International Advisory Board. If you don't know who the Bilderberg Group are, I'm telling you right now it's absolutely important that you should. The Bilderberg Group or Bilderberg Conference is an unofficial invite-only conference which consists up to 130 guests, most of whom are of influence in the fields of business, media, politics, banking, and even royalty attend. The meetings are held behind closed doors without any disclosure of what was spoken about during the meetings. 
The decisions made there are not decisions that benefit the general public. The Bilderberg Group promotes one world government out to destroy the sovereignty of sovereign nations. Here is Michael Ignatieff, former leader of the Liberal Party, denouncing the secrecy of Bilderberg Group. The, the point about Bilderberg, maybe people don't know what this is about, but it, it's very important that in a democracy, elected leaders don't go to highly secret meetings that the people don't know anything about. I don't know where I'm going and what I'm doing. I have a public appointment book. If I have the honor to be a prime minister, you know what I'm doing, you know, and, and, and that transparency, I think, is important. And the failure of organizations like Bilderberg to be transparent has created an enormous amount of anxiety and resentment in the sense there's some kind of secret world where stuff gets decided. I don't want to be in any secret world where things are being decided. I want to be in transparent public places where things are decided. Also, the Power Corporation of Canada is a diversified international management and holding company. Through its subsidiary companies, it has interest in the financial services sector in Canada, the U.S., and Europe, and it holds interest in the communications and media sectors. So Trudeau was involved with both of these entities, and also the CEO of Power Corp is also a Bilderberg attendee. Gerald Bowie was a member of David Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission. Rockefeller is a chairman of the Bilderberg Group. The Trilateral Commission, Council on Foreign Relations, and the Bilderberg Group are very well known for promoting a global government, or what others have called a new world order. In 1942, even before the war was over, one of the three sister, sisters, the um, Council on Foreign Relations, decided plotting a new world government to replace the, the uh, Third Reich, in effect, that would take in us all, including Canada. And so they started taking steps in that direction. The three sisters, incidentally, are the Bilderbergers, the uh, Council on Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission, with the Bilderbergers being the apex of the whole thing. And that's where the international bankers congregate in secret and make decisions that affect our life. Well, they have gone on, well, they didn't go on the record, but David Rockefeller said that surely it was better for the elite of the world and bankers to run the world than for the kind of nation states that we've had in recent times. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order, a world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order. All these new challenges are bringing together about the biggest restructuring we have ever seen, not just of the global economy, but of the global order as a whole. It is a new world order. But in a globalized economy, we are going to have to take global responsibilities. And there going to, is going to have to be some semblance of global governance on these questions. With every day that passes, a global economic collapse seems to be only a matter of time, mainly due to the massive amounts of debt and how monetary mechanics operates. Could this be part of the agenda to destroy the sovereignty of nations? So it was Pierre Trudeau and Gerald Bowie who changed the policies of the Bank of Canada with influences from Bilderberg Group, Trilateral Commission, and also the Bank of International Settlements. The policies they changed allow the Bank of Canada to contract its work out to other banks to create the Canadian national currency. So how did they legitimize changing the policy? And so that brings it to what Terry's going to talk about is what happened in 1974. Well, in 1974, uh, there was a recession in the United States. Here in Canada, they blew it way out of proportion. They made it sound like it was going to be the end all of recessions. Uh, that we needed to make some changes. Sold the Canadian government and the people. 
uh, on the idea of opening up the Bank of Canada again, loosening the regulations, allowing for private banks to create our currency. So that's what made it go from the $18 billion to the, what is it, 588? The change in policy came, they said would help the Canadian economy recover from what the government billed as a major recession, when in reality the recession was small at best, as seen in this graph. The issuance of credit through issuing loans is controlled by private banks. Up until prior to former Prime Minister Brian Mulroney, private banks were only allowed to do fractional reserve banking, lending out the same dollar no more than 12 and a half times, meaning all banks had to hold an 8% reserve in their vaults. Brian Mulroney dropped it to a 0% reserve, so now banks can just make money out of thin air by inputting the data on a computer screen and lend it to you with interest attached. Because of former Prime Minister Paul Martin, who also happens to be a Bilderberg attendee, Canada now borrows around 95% of its money from private corporate banks. Now, private banks like CIBC, TD Bank, Scotia Bank, RBC, etc. are the ones that have been secretly creating a large portion of the Canadian national currency and up until recent times have had a banknote company called BA International print the paper with the words Bank of Canada on it to give it the illusion the Bank of Canada printed it. reason why I say up until recent times is because BA International announced that at the end of 2012 they will no longer be printing any Canadian paper currency. When they print this money, they don't just print it and hand it to the economy to use for construction or reconstruction of schools, bridges, hospitals, community centers, or whatever else you can think of. No. They print it, loan it to us expecting every dollar and cent to be repaid with compounded interest attached. Let me explain this more thoroughly in case you don't get it because it's a little hard to wrap your head around. Interest is money owed with a fee attached on top of the money owed. Compounded interest is a fee that is periodically added to the original money owed, resulting in a new balance of money owed, which then triggers a new interest assessment which results in having a fee on top of the original money owed. Mathematically, the debt can never be repaid. So from 1938 to 1974, money was created and lent to the public, but with no interest attached. This means if $1 million was made and lent to the public, then only $1 million would have to be paid back. Today when private banks create $1 million, they lend it to us and expect us to repay $1 million plus compounded interest. Compounded interest is interest that is added every day to the original money owed. If you look at the size of the Canadian debt, it's this big. You look at the amount of money we borrowed from private banking institutions uh, that, that led to this debt. We borrowed that much of debt. We borrowed that much money. That's how much money we borrowed. Every day we're paying over $100 million in compound interest. So compound interest doesn't mean you get 2% every day. It means 2% not the 2% which is going 2% on that, 4% which is now 2% on that, 8% which is now 2% on the 16%. People don't get it, we're paying compound interest. Mr. Trudeau, would you right your Sir, father's please. wrongs by restoring the Bank of Canada? Please, stop yelling over here. Sir, would you right your father's wrongs by restoring the Bank of Canada? We currently pay $170 million a day on compound interest to private banks. Could you please restore the Bank of Canada? Sir, $170 million a day on compound interest, it sure is a lot, sir. Would you restore the Bank of Canada? I trust Mark Carney and what he's doing. The former governor of the Bank of Canada, Mark Carney, who was the governor from 2008 to 2013, was also a Bilderberg attendee, and he is also a former Goldman Sachs executive. He has written publications about Canada and the New World Order. This is what uh, Mark Carney wrote about the Canada and the New World Order. The theme of this conference, Adapting a New World Order, suggests it is clear how global commerce and finance will reorganize the wake of the current crisis. However, the outcome is far more preordained. How we manage the rebalancing of the global economy could profoundly influence how open, equitable, and prosperous the New World Order will be. So clearly Mark Carney is a New World Order puppet uh, perpetuating the New World Order, One World Government agenda. 
Mark Carney was the engineer of what happened in the European Union in the country of Cyprus when people's bank accounts got frozen and nobody could take their hard-earned money out, especially successful business people. Former governor of the Bank of Canada before Mark Carney, David A. Dodge, was also a Bilderberg attendee. And what do the CEOs of these private banks in Canada have in common with Mark Carney, David Dodge, and the people that changed the policy in 1974? You guessed it, they are also Bilderberg attendees. So this has been a clear takeover by the Bilderbergers, the New World Order architects. How important it is to get control of our monetary system again. Because the people, the people that were on the bus, we understand what the real issue is. And uh, it's a complicated issue. And uh, it's so complicated that I don't think that the government that we have here, or the Prime Minister that we have currently, really understands how important it is. And we can see what's happening around us when we see every day more and more homeless people on the streets, when we see the factories all over the country getting closed down, when we see uh, lack of job opportunities for people getting out of college and university and for everybody else. And, uh, you know, sometimes I get the feeling that we're on the, the brink of a serious economic disaster that's going to change the way that we live in this country, in the United States, and everywhere in the world. So we really have to do something about it. And, and you know, we really should have at least 100,000 people here today because we really have to make this change happen. Because if we don't, we're going to lose civilization because that's really what's at stake here. Right on. So this is where we should be all up in arms. Unlike the fraudulent Federal Reserve in the U.S., the Bank of Canada can loan up to 50% of our currency interest-free pursuant to the Bank of Canada Act. Our politicians just allow the private institutions to continue to rob us blind. In other words, the Bank of Canada can make our money for free instead of having foreign bankers make the money out of thin air and attaching compounded interest to it. So the Committee on Monetary and Economic Reform, Commer for short, have filed a lawsuit in the federal court against the Bank of Canada and Finance Minister for not properly using the Bank of Canada pursuant to the Bank of Canada Act. So it looks like restoring the Bank of Canada is not a conspiracy theory as claimed by Justin Trudeau. I'm, hang on, that's, okay. that's all the conspiracy theories. Uh, I trust the Bank of Canada as it is okay. right now. To, uh, to uh, uh, respect Mark Carney, and I'm not going to Bilderberg anytime soon. Okay, but you made mention about... <laughs> there we go, there we go, I know you're not No, but you made mention of the family living standard. If we restore the Bank of Canada... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind for the Bank of Canada. It is, it's fine. Have you received any money from Paul Desmarais sir. and the Power Corp okay, come with to me, your sir. campaign? Come with me, sir. Come with me. Why hasn't the media reported this, you ask? Why would the Bilderberg members report on themselves? Peter Mansbridge and countless others in Canadian media have attended Bilderberg. So Bilderberg Group controls the media. Comer estimates that Canadians pay $170 million a day to private banks to service only the interest on the loans. We don't even pay any of the loan itself. That's why it's no surprise that the Canadian press just recently published an article stating that Canadian bankers are the highest paid CEOs in North America. We have been made financial slaves to the New World Order. Restoring the Bank of Canada, or better yet, looking at local currencies and community currencies are the answer. If the people do not gain back control over the creation of our own currency, we are doomed because the Bilderberg Group and other globalist entities have an agenda that is being completed incrementally. Uh, I had a friend, Nick Rockefeller, okay, who was one of the Rockefeller family, and he, uh, uh, when I was running for governor in Nevada, he came to me, introduced himself to me through an attorney, and uh, we became friends. We started talking about things, and... Um, I learned an awful lot from Mr. Rockefeller. And one of the things that we used to talk about was the ultimate plan of the banking industry, what they wanted to accomplish. And the goals of the uh, banking industry, not, not just the Federal Reserve System, but the private banks in Germany and England, all over Italy, all over the world, they all work together. They're all central banks. So uh, the ultimate goal that these people have in mind is the goal to um, create a one world government run by the banking industry, run by the bankers. 
right? And uh, the whole the whole agenda is to create a one world government where everybody has an R R an RFID chip implanted in them. All money is to be um, in those chips, right? There'll be no more cash. And this is giving me straight from Rockefeller himself. This is what they want to accomplish. And all money will be in your chips. And so, any so not, instead of having cash, any time you have money in your in your in your chip, they can take out whatever they want to take out whenever they want to. If they say you owe us this much money in taxes, they just deduct it out of your chip digitally. Total control. Total control. And if you're like me or you, and you're protesting what they're doing, they can just turn off your chip. This next story we have for you is kind of wild. You might call it uh, microchip commitment. A young man by the name of Emil Grafstra and Jennifer Tomlin, they are dating, have total access to each other's homes, cars, and computers. And they have that access by way of matching electronic microchips that are implanted under their skin. They're joining us this morning to, uh, well, to make you understand all of this, or to try to make me understand all of it. They're joining us from Vancouver, Canada, and I appreciate uh, your being with us. They want chips to be implanted under human skin to be used as a digital ID and to be used as electronic currency. Through incremental steps, they have conditioned the public to chips for years now. First it came out to put in the pets, then it put into the cards and driver's licenses, and now they are in every phone and Walmart even puts them in their clothes. We can see the cashless society agenda from the New World Order rushing in quickly here in Canada. Introducing Mint Chip from the Royal Canadian Mint. The evolution of currency. Money, as we know it, is fine for today, but tomorrow is a different story. Imagine a whole new breed of transactions that are smaller, faster, and virtually everywhere. That's where Mintchip comes in. Mintchip is currency in a digital form. Using a chip, you securely load value onto a smartphone, USB device, computer, tablet, or cloud. Maybe even some future device that doesn't even exist yet. Now, you're ready to go. Royal Canadian Mint Chip might soon replace cash. Now, if you haven't heard of the Royal Canadian Mint Chip, it is a, uh, a chip that will work in hand with software for um, cellular, cellular devices. Uh, you can also use them on the computer. And uh, you basically, it will be considered as money in the future but right now you just you would load up money onto it uh, do small time transactions below ten dollars um, around March of 2012 the mint chip released a commercial uh, portraying their vision of Canada eliminating paper and coin currency and only having digital currency uh, here's a quote from David Everett the British uh, cryptographic expert hired years ago to work on the mint chip. He says, quote, I would look on it very much as an alternative and hopefully a replacement for physical cash. So obviously the agenda is to eliminate the physical cash. Um, <clears throat> the justification of the existence of the mint chip, their excuses, uh, to bring in the mint chip technology is the claim that printing coins are costing too much money and carrying around change is really inconvenient. This kind of reminds, it seems like history is repeating itself, doesn't it? It's like when the merchant bankers were telling everybody to deposit their gold and their silver into, into bank accounts so that they can carry around paper promissory notes and it's not so heavy. Um, Eventually, they eliminated the gold standard, and all that was what was money was now the promissory notes, which the promissory notes were no longer considered promissory notes. They are now considered legal tender, and now they can lend as much money, they can create money out of thin air as much as they want and lend it to people with compounded interest attached. But now they're taking it a step further. They want to eliminate legal tender and coinage so that. They have full control over the financial uh, sector. You know, that way if you owe money on taxes, they automatically deduct it. They'll know who you give money to, where you receive money. Um, you know, if you protest, they turn your chip off. Um, it 
it's it's a bad thing guys and you know the mint chip is going to be combined with smart technologies and if you're not updated on the enslavement of smart technologies the smart technologies uh, smart appliances will be used in combination with the smart grid to spy and control all information the mint chip will essentially be part of the smart grid because it's going to be used by smart technologies um, smartgridnews.com reported that the smart grid can be considered a transactive agent that is it will enable financial informational as well as electrical transactions among consumers grid assists and other authorized uses so right there it's stating that you know transactions will be made in using the smart grid um, George Salgan, professor of economics at the University of Georgia, said, quote, With Minchip, you could conceivably have the system running where not a soul involved has a bank account or a credit card. That's the difference, end quote. So, it seems like when the Minchip is fully implemented, they are going to combine government and bank into one entity. That way nobody needs any bank accounts because all their money is going to be stored on a chip that they carry around. That will be their account. So clearly we see a strive for government to control everything. You know, right now bank and government, uh, you know, we can say they're brothers who have cleverly figured out how to run the world. Well, pretty soon government's going to be the bank. The Bilderberg Group has full control over Canada. It's time to wake up. They have control over the Canadian Council of Chief Executives, to the CEOs of the private banks of Canada, and even the Prime Minister has attended. David Rockefeller is chairman of the Builder Group. Some even believe we, the Rockefeller family, are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States characterizing my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure one world if you will if that's the charge i stand guilty and i am proud of it david rockefeller memoirs page 405 this present window of opportunity during which a truly peaceful and interdependent world order might be built, will not be open for too long. We are on the verge of a global transformation. All we need is the right major crisis and the nation will accept the new world order. David Rockefeller, September 23, 1994. Just recently, Stefan Polo started a seven-year term as governor of the Bank of Canada on June 3rd as Mark Carney made his way to become governor of the Bank of England. He headed Export Development Canada, a federal crown corporation, and has been listed on the World Economic Forum annual meeting. So far, I've not seen any ties to the Bilderberg Group, but he was appointed by Harper Government's finance minister, and we all know who the Harper Government works for. Will Stephen Polos work for the people or follow Mark Carney's footsteps? I will do my utmost to live up to the very high standards of those who came before me. Stephen Polos. The quote above is reported by CTV. Looks like Polos will be following the footsteps of Bilderberg globalist Mark Carney. People need to wake up. The money supply needs to be restored to the people.